Great. Well, thanks for having me. It's so awesome to see everybody again. It's, it's, I've really wanted to come back at some point this year, and I'm, I'm sad I can't do it in person, but I'm, I'm glad I get to see all of you, at least on Zoom. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how some other countries are responding to uh, coronavirus, uh, specifically Pakistan, uh, because that's probably the country I'm most familiar with. Uh, this past summer, I spent two months in Pakistan uh, in Karachi, uh, helping to support a brand new EM residency program that had just started there last year. Um, EM is still really new in Pakistan. Um, it started uh, just in 2011. Uh, it was, began as a recognized specialty. And um, as of now, there's only about 20 or 30 fully trained emergency medicine doctors across the whole country uh, of 220 million people. Um, so it's it's a you know a fledgling specialty there, um, but it's also a really exciting time um, because the first real generation of EM uh, residency trained doctors there are starting out. Um, as of now, there's about 10 uh, EM residency programs, and I went to support uh, a new one in Karachi that had just started two years ago by one of the former Global Health Fellows here at Harvard. Uh, so this is a picture of all of us this past summer. Uh, uh, on Eid. Uh, we all got dressed up and, and celebrated and um, I miss all of them dearly. They're really wonderful, amazing people. Um, so uh, here's just a couple pictures from last summer. Um, we did a lot of uh, teaching, um, very similar to what we did at UMaryland actually. Um, a lot of sim, a lot of um, kind of flipped classroom models, um, and they're really enthusiastic and eager to learn and I just really, really enjoyed uh, being there. Uh, but I've been thinking of them a lot now because I think they've been put under just tremendous strain um, with uh, the coronavirus outbreak in, in Pakistan. Um, just to kind of give you a sense of what the ED is like there on a typical day before the coronavirus uh, started, um, they would typically see um, more than a thousand patients per day. Um, they had only about a uh, 40 beds in the ED, so a lot of cycling patients in and out. Um, a lot of care taking place in hallways and stretchers out in the waiting area. Um, in the particular uh, teaching hospital where I was, there were only two fully trained uh, faculty members and most of the care was delivered by medical officers and junior residents in their first or second year of training. Um, so it's a very different model because um, a lot of the care would go unsupervised um, uh, versus you know, in the United States where you know, attendings are watching very closely and seeing every single patient. Um, so you can imagine, you know, with that type of environment, um, with more than a thousand patients per day um, before all of this started, that um, you know a, a new disease outbreak can really um, kind of push a, a place like this to its limit. Um, here's some of the numbers, just to kind of compare Pakistan to USA, if any of you um, Pakistan has had a really low number of confirmed total cases, and th there's a lot of question as to why that is. Um, it, it is similar to other countries in South Asia, um, India, Nepal, uh, Bangladesh, um, in, in its low numbers of confirmed cases. Um, you know, part of that is explained by the low number of tests that they're doing, only about you know, a 20th of, or so of what we're doing in the United States. Um, but it's not fully explained by that because their positive test rate is only 10%, um, which you, know, you, you wouldn't quite expect. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of, you know, thoughts as to why this might be. Um, part of it is probably the, uh, the patients there. Um, the average age in Pakistan is, is much younger than the United States. I think the average age in the United States is about 38. In Pakistan, that's 24. Um, so the younger population may be protective. Um, part of it might be that the lockdown measures there were uh, put into place earlier. Um, so they're just in a flatter part of the curve. Um, and then finally, um, Part of it could be the um, kind of living situations there. Um, you have a lot more multi-generational households uh, versus, you know, in the United States where we um, put a lot of our older folks um, together in nursing homes, which, you know, have been a, a real um, vector for the spread of the coronavirus in our country. Um, here is uh, what the total cases look like in Pakistan, and it, it's a little alarming because it is it does seem to be hitting a steeper part of the curve over the last week or two um, and similar the, the deaths has kind of followed a similar trend um, and you know why is that well this is kind of what um, Islamabad the capital of Pakistan looks like nowadays um, and it's 
you know, incredibly crowded and you can see there's a few people wearing masks, but um, not most. Um, lockdowns have been enforced by the military and the police there, but it's uh, um, been erratic as to different parts of the country um, and the level of lockdown that's being enforced. Um, and then I think the big concern um, now is with Ramadan coming, um, the government there has allowed people to gather um, in mosques for, for Ramadan, um, which has been highly controversial. Um, uh, and either people are really afraid that this is going to become a major um, way that the coronavirus spreads in the country. Um, this is a, a picture of Karachi, um, which is the largest city in Pakistan of 18 million people or so. Um, and it's just actually astounding to me for two reasons. One, um, the street is empty. Um, the, you know, usually the traffic here is horrendous. I remember just getting across town would sometimes take 45 minutes just to travel a few miles and it's completely emptied out now uh, because of the, the military enforcing the shutdown. And then second, um, you can actually see across the city, um, the, the air is cleared up significantly um, because of the reduced air pollution, which I guess is, um, you know, perhaps the only silver lining in all of this. Um, here are some pictures from how the hospital uh, that I, I work at called the Indus Hospital was preparing for the outbreak. They actually did a, a tabletop exercise where they modeled their emergency department and um, how they were going to cohort patients together and add additional protection, um, uh, like plexiglass barriers to try to decrease transmission uh, among patients there. Um, you know, there they don't really have individual rooms in their emergency department. It's more like a big open ward concept. Um, uh, but they are no strangers to using um, N95 and PPE there. Um, you know, tuberculosis is quite common. Um, so pretty much every day um, people are um, in respiratory isolation. So they, they just try to expand that capacity as, as much as they could. Um, here's what the emergency department there looks like now. Um, you know, it's again a big open area um, with, you know, monitors and, and resuscitation equipment and it's actually fairly well equipped. Um, they have a lot of capability. They can intubate. Um, they can, you know, put people in CT scan. They can, um, you know, perform surgery and send people off to the cath lab. So for a, a, a hospital there, it's actually, you know, fairly technologically savvy and has a lot of capability, which makes working there quite fun. You actually can make quite a big difference if, uh, you know, you're able to to use those uh, resources in the right way. Um, here are some of the pictures of the residents um, that uh, I wanted to share with you. Um, you know, they're under tremendous strain. Um, you know, they see um, probably 80 to 100 patients per shift there, per 10 hour shift. Um, so they're, you know, already quite overworked. And um, I, I think it's, it's just been a huge challenge for them um, because most of the care really falls uh, on them first and foremost. Um, but uh, I think that they're, It's been in good spirits overall, um, despite you know the challenges there. There, um, it's really amazing to me, kind of the how positive they've stayed um, throughout all of this. Um, so I'm really hoping that you know at some point I'll get to go back there and and check in and, and visit all my friends that I've I've made while I was there, and um, I'm really looking forward to that day when the travel restrictions are limited. And, um, you know, we can reconnect. Um, it's been really awesome to you know, can stay in touch with them this whole time. We've been sharing a lot of resources back and forth, uh, PPE guidelines between their government and ours and, you know, how their ED is managing patients and, and sort of the limited resource environment um, compared to kind of a higher resource environment we have here in Boston. Um, it's been a really rewarding experience and, and I'm just really grateful to have the opportunity to go there and, and help out and connect with all of them. Um, so yeah, with that, I'm happy to take questions. Actually, if you don't mind, John, why don't we um, take kind of all of the, the international type of questions sure. yeah. as a group right after, if you can stick around for a bit. Um, yeah. and, uh, and thanks. So I never saw those pictures of your trip to Pakistan, so it's kind of interesting. And it is scary that that picture of uh, Karachi, I guess, uh, how crowded things are. Um, so I, I'm, anyway, um, let's move forward. Uh, our next speaker is Maita Hausendefeld. Maita is a graduate of the EM program from 2016, after which she did an emergency cardiology right. fellowship and recently moved back to her, uh, her home country of the Netherlands. So uh, Maita, do you want to talk a little bit about how things are back home? There you are. Oh, you're, you're muted. You're, you're on mute. You're mute. You're Especially mute. she's on mute, but we can't hear, hear you, Maita.
Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, you can. Okay. The headphones then. How's everyone? <laughs> Thank Good you so much you. for this uh, invitation to speak today. I'm um, talking to you from the Netherlands, and I first wanted to go over a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, what the Netherlands is about, and then about the corona outbreak we've had, and the government um, measures they enforce, as well as the hospital measures, and then some talk about a little bit of treatment differences when compared to the U.S. So just to give you kind of a perspective of how small our country is, um, it's actually heavily populated with 17.4 million people, but it's only 16,000 square miles in size, which is just ever so slightly a bit bigger than the state of Maryland. So we have a lot of people in this country and they are very condensed mostly in the west of the country. Uh, we're actually the 16th most populated country in the world. So, you know, dealing with a global health outbreak, you can always imagine that puts a lot of strain on uh, on measures and control and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, we have about 300 hospitals here in the country, but not all of them are, you know, appropriately equipped to handle critically ill patients. Uh, and we've had about 1,100 ICU patients, uh, sorry, ICU beds at baseline. Um, just to give you some background on our healthcare system, what's interesting to know is that we have a mandatory uh, insurance system where everybody in the country has healthcare insurance. So we have had to deal less with people that don't have money to come to the hospital uh, or something like that. On top of that, everybody has a private departments and hospitals. So just to give you that kind of as a scope of, you know, what the situation is like here. Um, you know, the, the problem was that what, what happened, our first case that was diagnosed was at the end of February, on 20, February 27th, actually at our hospital where I work, which is in the south of the country. And that was the first case that was diagnosed. Um, but we had we were already lagging behind at that point because just the week prior to that we've had a big uh, school vacation where a lot of people go out to either Italy, Spain, or the Sun or something like that to uh, you know enjoy a warmer climate because it's not that warm here, or they go to Austria or Switzerland to ski, which uh, later on we learned was also an area of outbreak. So we had the first patient, he came from Milan. The other problem with the timing of uh, people traveling a lot was that there was also a big, um, like, like a little, like a festivity, it's carnival. It's like the beginning of Lent, which is used to be a Catholic uh, holiday in the Netherlands, but now it's mostly about You know, dressing up and getting drunk and crowding raids. So there was a huge outbreak. And at first, the government was thinking that there was, there were no patients that were already came that already had come back from other countries that were infected. But actually, looking back, it turned out that there were a bunch of people there that were infected and later spread the disease. So the south of the country has been hit hardest, mostly because of that uh, big event, because it's five days of you know drinking, being out in bars, being close to each other, et cetera. So um, the total numbers of COVID patients, I want to just talk to you about just to give you a little bit of an idea of how much of an outbreak we've had here. We've had uh, 4,100 patients that tested positive. I do want to let you guys know that we've not been so liberal with testing, only those that are admitted and some healthcare workers are allowed to get tested, um, you know, just to compare you know, 2,300 cases per 1 million uh, population have been tested here versus like 3,700 per 1 million population in the U.S. So just give you a bit of a comparison. And then um, we uh, have about, have had about 11,000 uh, 11, patients who have been admitted, most of which have been over 70. So a lot of older people that have come into the hospital. And uh, reported deaths thus far have been 5,204 uh, patients that have died. Uh, the majority is over 80. Um, but just, again, to give you the perspective, we're not testing everybody. For example, my grandma passed away about a month ago. She, she was in a nursing home, and um, there was a corona outbreak. But because we as a family decided she's 92, we're going to do palliative care, was never tested uh, so she's not part of that statistic. 
We're currently, fortunately, on a downtrend. Our biggest peak was around the uh, last week of March, beginning of April. And we're now seeing, um, you know, a trend of, you know, people that are testing positive, but also we're seeing a downtrend in ICU admissions, a downtrend in admissions in general. Uh, and this kind of came, you know, the big peak is what we saw was about two weeks after the government enforced their restrictions. What we did was close to what the U.S. has done, but a little bit different uh, than a lot of other co European countries have done. Uh, after first outbreak uh, or the first confirmed case, a lot of people were saying, uh, you know, we don't really need to be so strict about this because the Dutch people really, really enjoy their freedoms and they don't really want to be restricted a lot or you know, controlled by the government. So the, a lot of people said, we don't need all those rules, you know, the lockdown, that's crazy. We don't, you know, we sh really shouldn't be doing that. So first, there weren't that many restrictions, but around uh, March 15th is when the government said we really need to start controlling this because they started seeing the uptrend, but we'll do what we call an intelligent lockdown. So that meant that schools were closed, restaurants, bars, sports clubs, you know, national parks and some shops closed. Uh, and the government said you have to keep social distancing one and a half meter distance. Um, and, you know, you cannot group together. It has to be, you know, no more than three people as a group. Otherwise, you get a fine uh, up to 390 euros. Uh, so... Um, most people have been pretty good about this. Our um, prime minister has been very clear from the beginning where he has said, we'll do this intelligent lockdown, but we can only do that as long as people are adhering to the rules and sticking to it. So if you guys are not keeping up with the rules and we see that too many people are lax with it, we're going to in strict force or rules compared to like Belgium, France, you know, uh, Spain, which are countries that people have not been allowed to actually go outside. And here we have allowed this as long as they are doing it in a safe way. Uh, and I know, for example, my aunt is in Paris and she has to have like a letter that she can go to the grocery store and she can only do it for X amount of hours a, a day or a week, I think. Um, so that's very strict and very different from what we've done. Um, and then to look at what what kind of happened in our hospital is because we uh, are a level one trauma center, neurosurgical center, stroke center, PCI center, um, but there are two locations. We normally have about close to 800 beds, um, but what we started doing when we saw the uptrend coming in patients, uh, we decided to, to cancel all elective care. ORs were closed for all elective care. Clinics were closed for all elective care, except for some emergency stuff that they could easily deal with in, in the ED. And uh, what we uh, what we saw in the emergency department is is you know we have emergency physicians. It's, it's a specialty. Uh, and we have our ED staff 24 seven with emergency physicians as well. What we, we saw is that our, co co -work, our colleagues from internal medicine, pulmonology came down and we developed a sort of a rapid assessment team where what we did is we saw all the patients that were sent in from their PCPs because most get sent in f through their PCPs by some screening because the PCP thinks maybe these people need to be admitted. We would see them, uh, assess the assess to really feel like do we really feel this is a suspected COVID case? Do we think they need to be admitted, or do can they go home if they are going to be admitted? Do they need ICU care, or do they need just regular floor care? And that happened really really quickly, uh, and we were dispositioning patients and getting them out of the park department within 90 minutes because we had that approach. We didn't need all the blood work back. We didn't need all, you know, the complete assessment to be done as long as they were suspected cases and we could determine the appropriate level of care. They were taken out of the department and they would deal with all the other stuff upstairs. And, you know, if it was sort of questionable, I see you would come down to see, you know, if they, if they needed to stay, uh, you know, to be observed a little bit longer or if they had to come to the ICU, uh, which really offloaded us in the emergency department. We also had our surgical, um, surgical co-workers come down and they took over all the fast track stuff, all the ortho stuff. So that really helped us out a lot. So we were never truly so overwhelmed. 
as like the stuff that you can hear Nick say, or, you know, what happened in New York is that there was so much crowding going on. Fortunately, we did not have that. Um, you know, what we did also do is that we were very aggressive about transferring patients to other hospitals. Um, and it was kind of interesting. What we did is uh, a couple of hospitals used this uh, EMS bus. Uh, I can send a picture of, of that later, but what they did is they had six beds in just a regular like, you know, bus and they would put them vented in that bus to drive them to other hospitals, but they would also have, you know, mobile ICU units from other, other centers come and bring them, uh, take them and bring them to other places as well. And we also transferred to patients that didn't need ICU care at that time, but we did that on purpose because we felt that these people had a uh, potential to later decompensate. So if we kept only the not so sick people, we were worried that we we're still gonna really um, overwhelm our uh, ICU. What we did as well is that the ICU that we had, we have about 30 beds, but we closed the PACU for regular care and we used those beds um, like they did in New York as well in some places where we used those beds as ICU beds uh, as well and the regular floors were almost completely closed um, so we had a 200 bed cohort unit basically where we could admit only COVID or COVID suspected patients so I think that was really awesome in terms of that preparedness that we had and we had set it up um, set it up front really fast because we knew what had gone on in Italy and uh, we were really worried that we were going to go there as well. And thankfully that, that didn't quite happen to us. Um, the, let me think what else. Oh, another great thing that we were able to do was transfer a couple of patients out to Germany as well. Um, so we had about 48 patients total from our country that were accepted by Germany and we still owe them. So there might, there's some talk of some of them coming back if they get overloaded, but we're all on a downtrend now. So I don't think that will be quite so necessary. Um, you know, we never really ran out of PPE, which was good. But one thing that's, that I saw as a big difference with the US is we at first were not allowed to wear PPE on shift when we weren't going into a PUI's room. Um, and that later changed for us after we had some discussions about it where it's now optional, but I don't see as many people wearing uh, PPE the whole shift as I would see in the US. I think that's part of that as a cultural thing. And part of that was um, that the hospital first didn't feel that was a good idea for us to do. Um, but now it's happening a bit more. We also, at my region, uh, healthcare providers were not tested for COVID if they were exposed or if they had their home and uh, not come back until they had, were symptom free for 24 hours because I think the hospital worried that there were going to be too much there going to be too much staff that was going to test positive and wouldn't have a functioning hospital um, yeah so I think that's kind of where we are right now we're on a downtrend so slowly we are releasing some of the restrictions from the government so schools are going to reopen People are going to go and travel more. So it's a little nerve wracking in a way to know that we might see an uptake, take, but we can't, you know, just sit around wait at our home, in our homes, you know, so we're going to have to see what happens there. Um, and uh, for now, we're, we're slowly restarting routine care in the Netherlands. Um, just to talk about some, some minor treatment differences that we've seen, or at least that I've seen that I've understood has been going on in the U.S. and it's different for our patients, you know, a lot of stuff is the same, you know, supportive care, early intubation. We really didn't use any NIV uh, from very early on because we heard from the Italians that it wasn't working well, except, you know, some of the, those hoodie things, but we didn't have those fancy things that they had. So, you know, we really never did that. We don't have high flow in our ED, unfortunately. We do do early proning. Um, we have been using chloroquine and hydrochloroquine in, in, as part of a study. Uh, so most of our patients do get that, but they're all admitted and monitored and they don't get it if their QTC is too long. So that is very different. We also haven't had any people taking over the counter medications, uh, fortunately. Um, uh, and then 
we used so, some of the enterovirals initially, but we stopped using that very early on. No steroids. And I think another big difference in our country culturally is that a lot of people at baseline don't want to be resuscitated or intubated when they're elderly and the family is very much on board with this. And even if they have COPD and they're, you know, gold four, a lot of patients will say, you know, I understand that I don't need to be ventilated or shouldn't be ventilated. Um, so I think that helped us a lot as well. I think that cultural difference of acceptance of end of life, but also um, we have the possibility more so than the U.S. to say as physicians, listen, you're 80, you have a lot of medical problems, you're not going to get an ICU bed. And we do that at baseline for a bit, but now during COVID, we're actually able to do that. And in general, patients and families are pretty acceptant of that. We've had a couple cases where, of course, you know, people don't feel so comfortable, but most of the times people do feel, um, you know, they just say like, okay, doctor, if you think that's best, then they are acceptant of that. So I think those were the main, you know, things how we've been handling COVID. And um, yeah, I'm curious to see if anyone has any questions. Also want to give a quick shout out to a couple of my coworkers that called in because they wanted to listen in to what I had to say. Uh, <laughs> so Ellen and Kim, hi. Uh, but yeah, I'll gladly take any questions then after I think Danya, right? Great. Thanks, Maita. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions coming up for you in, Great. in just a few minutes. So uh, next let's, um, <clears throat> let's move to Japan. Uh, Danya Koja is a graduate from the EM program in 2013 and uh, recently moved to Japan, I guess a couple of years ago with her husband. And after her comments, one of our other uh, graduates, Dr. Yoshi Mitarai, who is a graduate of our combined emergency medicine, internal medicine program, and then did a critical care fellowship out at Stanford. He graduated from EMIM in 2007. Um, he's going to have some comments about uh, Japan also. So, Danya, why don't you um, start things off? Um, I definitely think that you should all move to Japan. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm going to be talking about COVID in Japan and a little bit of background info about Japan. So, it's like 370,000 kilometers square, which is the same size of California. But three quarters of the country is not really habitable. So, you have 126 million people in a quarter of California. So it's, it can get pretty crowded. Um, and the Tokyo area is the most populous in the world, which is one of the reasons it's like the epicenter in um, Japan. And it's sort of like what Maida was talking about is that there's a universal healthcare system, whether it's coming from the government or from your job. And then they have the oldest population in the world. So 30% of people are 65 or above. And, and COVID has been really interesting in Japan because if you look at the numbers, although they had like the second case outside of, um, on January 16, it was in Japan, the numbers kind of stayed pretty flat up until towards like mid-March and that's when they started going up. And e even before that, the only big spike before that was the um, cruise ship, which was a, a pretty much like a point of contingency or something because the Japanese don't want to count it towards their total, but then they technically do show up as part of their total because they took care of them, and those like 700 people. So the total confirmed cases as of today is 15,200. And this is the Diamond Princess Cruise. Again, I'm not going to talk about that, but it was pretty fascinating how um, this was in my city of Yokohama, how they actually dealt with transporting the 700 patients and, and moving them forward and trying to figure out who goes where. So there's a lot of restrictions traveling from Japan. Interestingly, nobody asks me where I've been or what I, if I even have symptoms crossing the border here. So that was pretty interesting. But technically, there is a restriction from the CDC. One issue, though, is that, and this is one of the reasons we think that the numbers have gone up, is that restrictions to traveling to Japan are pretty loose. So they only started restrictions on people coming from China and South Korea on March 9th which is like what, a couple of months after everything started. And then there are restrictions from Europe and Egypt on March 21st. And what restrictions mean is that they ask you nicely to not use public transportation for 14 days if you've come from these countries so that you're not exposing the public. So as we can imagine, not everybody really complies to these regulations. 
you do have a lot of screening coming through the airports, but if you're, you're not screened and caught through the airports, then that's it. You just are asked nicely not to use public transportation. Reason number two that they think that the numbers went up is because this is the season of Hanami, which is the cherry blossoms festivals. So that started um, at the end of March and the beginning of April. So the biggest boom was April 2nd. And there's, it's a very cultural thing. It's not just looking at the flowers and a lot of people have their own events that they do. So although the, the official cultural events were canceled by the government, people were still going. And that was causing a lot of like um, congregations. The other thing is the concept of Golden Week, which is actually right now and today is supposed to be the last day. So Golden Week is basically this week in a couple of days where the entire country is on vacation and everyone is traveling. And there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's I think four cultural events during this week. So they also of course ask for people not to move from their prefecture, not to travel, not to congregate as well. But those have been the, the two most worrisome kind of events or things that may have caused the spike. And then the lockdown, which was kind of funny when people texted me, kept asking me, well, how's the lockdown going? How's the lockdown going? So the prime minister on April 7th went up and said, well, you know what? We're introducing a lockdown. So basically the idea was that they wanted to reduce contact with other people by 80%. I'm not sure how you're supposed to calculate that, but that's what we we're supposed to do. And it was only initially in some prefectures. So uh, just around like the Tokyo, the Osaka, places where it's really, really crowded. And it was actually supposed to end today, but in most places in the country, it won't. In some places they're gonna start to open up. And by open up, it means like the bars may start to open up a little bit. Um, karaoke bars are closed. So that was a huge disappointment, of course, for everyone. But everything else was open. Like they just suggest that places are closed. So um, as you see, this picture on the left is the uh, furniture store that I like to go to. And this is what they did during the lockdown. They created these like little plastic partitions and they just asked you to stay behind the partition while you're purchasing your things. And it was still open. On the right, you can see this is a, a local park and it was still open for, for the public to go to. And this was actually just taken word for word from one of the um, English uh, Japanese newspapers which is that the prime minister just requested that the people comply. It is not a demand. There are no legal penalties. There are no legal penalties for any of the places, for the stores, for the bars. It is just a request that people do that. The only thing that they had the um, authority to close was closing the elementary schools. The nurseries are not even closed. They're also requesting that if you don't really need that your children go to a, a nursery, that you don't send them. But it's not a demand per se. And that, that is another reason that these cases are spiking is because the lockdown per se is not something that's that enforceable. And then the third reason with the numbers and this, um, with the spike in the numbers is that the PCR testing is so low. It is insane. It's testing 0.1% of the population. If you can see this table is actually from the um, Ministry of Labor. And these are the numbers as of May 1st. They've only tested 144. 145,000 people in a country of 127 million. The reason for this is that their criteria is very stringent. Um, you have to have a fever for four days in order for you to be able to call the local health authorities and ask to be tested. And then they would direct you to where to go. They don't have enough kits or labs to do that. They finally started coming up with a different um, method to kind of um, send the tests to other prefectures. And then there is a lack of healthcare professionals who can actually do the test. In the latest announcement of the uh, Minister of Labor, Health and Welfare on April 26, he announced that dentists can now contribute to the force and they can actually do the testing after taking the course for the testing. So there's that. They did announce um, today actually that they are going to be pushing some more criteria to the public and ask people to get more tests but these criteria are not clear. They say, well, you know what, if you're feeling really sick, like you're short of breath, you're really fatigued, then call the local health authority numbers in your prefecture and then they will figure out if you can get tested. But that is not really well clarified with these local authorities either. Now, the thing that makes absolutely no sense is this. These are the numbers also from May 1st. And if you look at the numbers for the deaths, it's 0.3 for 100,000. 
which is really, really, really low. If you want to compare it to the rest of the world, um, the U.S. is, is 21 per 100,000, and we're not even that high on that list. And that's the part that's puzzling to everyone. No one really understands why. No one's complaining. But um, some theories about that is that because the older adults don't actually live in the larger cities that are the epicenters of the infection, um, older adults tend to live independently rather than to live with other older adults who get infected in like a nursing home setting. So those are a couple of the theories. What's fascinating to me as well is that a lot of the public health push, they're just talking about, well, are pregnant women, can pregnant women go out? Can pregnant women get exposed? There is very minimal focus on talking solely or explicitly just about older adults. I think it's just because, you know, they're just a lot of them. It's not necessarily thought of as a separate category. And then finally, um, of course, this caused the um, Tokyo 2020 to be canceled or postponed to next year, but we'll see about that. Um, I want to share this with you. This is the um, Japanese mascot for quarantine, because of course there has to be a mascot for everything. Um, however, Quora, the quarantine mascot, was not created for COVID. Um, he or she um, have been around for a while, but you know they kind of made a reappearance around COVID time. So that's all I have. Okay, great, Danya. Um, Yoshi, I'm gonna turn things over to, to Yoshi. And also I want to put a shout out to his wife, uh, Mi Fong. Mi Fong is one of our graduates from the EM program as well. So Mi Fong, I don't, I don't know if you're there with Yoshi as well, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> greetings to you. There you are, Yoshi. All right, go ahead, take it away, thanks. Good morning, well, uh, she did a great job. So I don't have much to add, but I just wanted to show uh, just only a few slides. So <clears throat> uh, basically just to going back to the, the PCR things, this graph, can you see me? Can you show my, see my slide, okay? So this is the number of PCRs done per 1,000 population for each country. So Japan is the second least in terms of number of PCR testing, like as you can see at the left corner. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, another thing about Japan is the number of IC bed is not a lot. And that's actually affecting the government decision when to let go of this uh, quote unquote lockdown, which is not really reinforceable as you heard. So Japan actually have only about 6,500 ICU beds and usually they are pretty full even before the COVID started. So that's actually what's making it very difficult for the government to say, okay, you guys can go back to the um, your own uh, companies and so forth. Another slide I wanted to show you just along with that for the ICU information, this is actually a graph of how many patients in Japan are on the ventilator machines. This is Tokyo information. So you can see that it peaked around the late April and hopefully it's gonna be continuing to go down and uh, that will help with the uh, release of the lockdown. In terms of the ECMO, Japan actually probably is for the number of patients we have. So this is uh, again, also Tokyo, the number of patients with ECMO is trending down. Even further down here, this is for ECMO patients as of May 5th. So uh, basically the red is a patient who is currently on ECMO and the black is the number of patients who died from ECMO and then blues are the patient who recovered from ECMO, it's decannulated. So uh, it's uh, interesting information as to what's going on regarding the ECMO as well. So those are the only slides I wanted to share and I wanted to ask the audience if they have any questions so far. All right, let, let's uh, open it up to some questions here. Um, Megan, uh, I hate to put you on the spot, but you had a question initially. Um, are you able to unmute and ask your question? I can unmute, can you hear me? Yes, perfect, thanks. Okay, um, Mike, to this question is kind of directed at you. Given the close proximity of all the European countries with, you know, neighboring countries and close borders and all the different approaches governments have taken to kind of different levels and metrics of social distancing and quarantine precautions. What is your sense of, from your family and friends that are in other countries in Europe, of kind of how, um, you know, are, are the governments, are, are people in the countries with kind of more lax restrictions kind of being, 
you know, our people in countries like France where and Spain, where they haven't been really allowed outdoors at all, do you sense that they have some concerns about the policies in their close neighbors and, and close neighboring countries that are so markedly different from their own country's approaches? Yeah, thanks for that question. It's actually a great question. We have give, gotten a lot of grief from Belgium mostly because they have much stricter rules than we do when we share a border. Um, and they were kind of pushing us to um, be stricter. However, I think when we look at the numbers though, I think we didn't do that poorly. Personally, I felt like we were a little bit behind and we could have done better if we were a little bit more aggressive in the beginning. But I think you can definitely see that even though we don't put people at home 24 seven, the infection rate has really gone down significantly. Um, I haven't personally heard a ton of grief coming from France or Spain, but there we also don't share a border. So, and basically all of Europe is sl ever so slightly a bit closed right now. So it's hard to cross the border. So they, um, they don't, we know we don't share that border with them. So they don't, you know, we don't have that problem so much with them. In Germany, the infection rate has been relatively lower than ours and they haven't, been so strict. I think they've been quite similar to our regulations. Um, so not so much from them. We have heard though, because just to clarify also on the, on the patients that went to Germany, those were Dutch patients. So it wasn't the Germans taking back their own people. It was the Germans taking our people uh, out of a European solidarity um, to help us out. So we are still sort of indebted to them and they have also they have been giving us a little bit of push to say you guys need to create more icu beds not just for you but if you know if we are hit harder in the future we need to be able to for you guys to take patients back you know out of germany which which was what we were also expecting to get we were also sending people out Home our area, and then if it would hit the north more of the country, then we would be taking people back, but that really hasn't happened so much. Um, so we have gotten some, just to summarize, we have gotten some grief from Belgium, but from other countries, it's not been too bad. Thank you for uh, weighing in on that. Yeah, no worries. So Kinchel had a question, uh, and I think it kind of alludes to something that Maita had, had asked, and I'll, I'll actually pose this to, to all three of, or all four of you, uh, John, if you could talk about Pakistan and Yoshi and Danya and Maita, um, having to do with, uh, I, I guess, just um, the culture and, and, and approach to patients that are elderly. Um, what, uh, you know, Maita, you said that, I, I guess, once you're, I don't know if there's a cutoff for age, but at, at a certain point in your life uh, when resources are limited, the, um, the culture there is accepting of the fact that, um, that patients may not get every possible bit of care the way we do in the United States right up until the, your very last day of life. Um, is that something that, um, that you are seeing and the rest of you guys are seeing in terms of the distribution of, of health care with these really sick COVID patients in, in other countries as well? Or, are, are the physicians out there making decisions about who goes on vents based on age? Or, and also, are there any other things that they're taking to, into account besides age uh, when deciding about whether to put patients on vents or deliver other heroic care? Right, yeah, and in the Netherlands, we, we, were, we're, we were getting closer, and I'm not quite sure if it ended up actually coming to fruition. I think at the same time, we were talking about this with the intensivists. Uh, we were seeing a little bit of a downtrend, but there was a plan to say um, 80, because Italy was doing that too, because they allowed for a very long time everybody to just get on vents, and they were seeing the effects of that um, after a few weeks where they couldn't wean these people and they didn't have any resources for younger patients. So we were already thinking that and learning from the things they had seen so we were thinking over 80, probably no ICU. And then 70s with 
significant comorbidities. Um, and, you know, it, we also, what we did though was like taking into consideration a large part was quality of life. Cause you know, there are a lot of, it's, we're relatively healthy people. So, you know, people at the, in their eighties are still getting on their bikes and doing their own groceries and doing all this stuff. So, you know, we would take that into consideration as well. So we didn't have clear cutoffs, but that were what we were talking about. Um, you know, the seventies plus comorbidities, eighties plus it's, it's a hard no. But thankfully, we, I still saw a couple of people that were like 82, super healthy, you know, that they ended up in the ICU, of course, not doing as great as all the other people, but we were able to still accommodate that. All right. Any comments about Japan or um, <clears throat> Pakistan? Um, age does not appear to be a bigger issue as much as it is like with comorbidities. Um, with quite a few of the ECMO reports that were coming out of um, Yokohama with like, especially with the cruise ship, because half of these people were 70 and older. Um, they still put them on ECMO, they still go to the ICU. So it wasn't that hard cutoff. Um, I don't know if they were using different kind of criteria, but also sort of as Maita alluded to, the culture is very, very different. Um, and then uh, with the, um, sorry, what else were we talking about? I think, uh, I think that's it. Um, yeah, one thing that's actually unique yep, about Japanese Japan. 70s, American 40. Yes, sir. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> one thing uh, that's unique about Japan is that the once you intubate the patients, we cannot terminally extubate them to let them die. Um, <clears throat> so um, that's very unique about Japanese practice as well. And it's not related to the question that was asked, but another thing that I wanted to let you know about Japan is that the um, we don't have MTAL out. So right now there's actually more cases where ambulance is rejected by the hospital, you know, place A, place B and place C and the patient has to stay in the ambulance for a while until they can find a place to go. That's one of the unique things about Japan as well. And then uh, just because of the yeah, <clears throat> opportunity to just speak up here, uh, you know, the question comes up in terms of, of why there are certain countries that have so much death and others don't have much death. And I don't know if you guys talked about it, one hypothesis that people have is that BCG vaccinations. Um, so in case you didn't know about it, that's one potential. Japan and Russia actually share the same type of BCG vaccination. And as you guys probably know, it has a non-specific immune boosting effect. So whether that's actually contributing to the number of deaths being relatively low compared with some of the other countries. But a good example is the Portuguese versus Spain. They're next to each other, but Portuguese is mandatory for BCG and they have much less death rate compared to Spain. Um, so, you know, just something to think about. Sure. And, uh, but actually before, before John chimes in, I, I did want to recognize, uh, Yoshi, he's out in San Francisco. So he logged on at 4.30 AM his time. So Yoshi, thanks for your commitment here. <laughs> so John, um, any thoughts about how things are in, in Pakistan? On this yeah, the, the BCG hypothesis has been talked about a lot in, in Pakistan because everyone is so perplexed as to why their case numbers are so low. Um, but I, I, I don't really know whether that hypothesis has been supported by any data as of yet, but it's really interesting to contemplate. Um, you know, the, the thing about elderly folks in Pakistan is that, you know, even before this started, um, the availability of critical care was you know, extremely limited by, by cost. Um, so there wasn't a, a cultural expectation that that resource would be you know, freely provided to everyone. Um, I, I don't know how it's changed during the, the COVID epidemic, but um, you know, I think that the, the concept of you know, an elderly person dying at home with their family was more accepted here. Um, and so that tended to be the status quo rather than elderly folks dying in hospitals. Okay, and Michael has one last question before the break. So it was asked, how has the COVID era changed practice of care with regards to other critical conditions in these nations, like STEMIs, trauma, strokes? Anyone? Oh, sure. I'll go. Bueller. <laughs> so so we, uh, we saw uh, the interesting decrease in all other conditions as well, uh, especially in the first couple of weeks. Uh, we saw barely any stroke patients, barely any STEMI patients. No one had anything to complain about. We only saw a couple of kids that fell off of trampolines because that's the stupid stuff that people do. Um, but otherwise, 
yeah, we, we didn't see much of anything else and we couldn't hardly explain it. And then now we are starting to catch up on that. And, you know, a couple of weeks in, we started seeing the delayed strokes. Um, so, and now we're getting to back to all the normal other problems again. So, you know, I don't know that we have a good explanation for these people that just died at home or if they just came in later or things weren't so bad or maybe we should just look away. <laughs> Sometimes not doing anything is maybe better. I don't know, but yeah, we definitely saw that as well, but we were still able to keep, you know, all our regular your level one trauma center for big regions. So we were able to maintain that uh, stroke center, all those other things were still operational. So we weren't shutting them down. We fortunately also didn't have any cardiologists saying, you know, give them TPA. Uh, so that was fortunate for us. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know where they are. Great. Any thoughts about <laughs> I don't know if Nick or um, and Nick's still on the phone or Josh, but I saw a report out of New York City that they typically have about 20 in-home deaths a day in New York City in the five boroughs. And during this pandemic, they've been averaging about 200 a day. So it's unclear if those are all people that have had STEMI strokes or whatever the cause of death is, because as you can under understand, the medical examiner is overwhelmed. So if they're over 65, it's all natural causes of death, and they're just going to slap something on the death certificate, but we don't know what the actual cause of death is. Right. And it yeah. kind of also goes into the last thing we talked about, but what we also saw was, you know, normally people are accepting of, of no, you know, DNR, DNIs, but we actually had like a fairly healthy seven year old and we're talking to the family member and they were, and we were like, we're talking about ICU care. And the son said, well, I'm sure you guys have something better to do to resuscitate my 70 year old mother. And we were all like, what are you talking about? Like, are you crazy? But people were very much, you know, like, my, I don't really have a problem. You know what I mean? I felt like people were kind of apologizing for the fact that they were coming to the hospital, which is a very interesting thing to see. So I think we probably saw a lot of people who decided to stay home and maybe they died at home or did something else. I don't know. Yeah. Is that, is that somebody in the back to ask a question? Or, uh, Ken, were you just having a seizure? Uh, no, no, Whoever's okay. Okay. Oh, right. Ben Lon okay. He's trying to get some attention. Ben, you're up uh, after after the break. So um, in all across the United States, they've also reported marked reductions in STEMIs and strokes coming into the emergency department. And so they're they're actually staging a national campaign to try to get the patients coming back because just like Michael said, they're all dying at home instead of coming in for care. So all right, well, um, uh, Maita, Yoshi, Danya, John, thanks so much for your time. Uh, if you are able to, we'd love to have you stay on to uh, help with answering questions a little bit later as well. But why don't we go ahead and take maybe a five or six minute break, and then at 9.45, we're going to start back up with Jenny and uh, Ben Launer. So time to refill your coffees. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>